Hello, my crafty friends. Today, we're continuing our study of the Messianic prophecies, and we're still in the portion of the prophecies that are talking about the names that Jesus was given before he was born. And um, number nine, let me give you a quick refresher of the other ones in case you haven't actually um, seen any of these before. Uh, Jesus was first. Christ was second. Lord was third. Emmanuel was four. King was five. Governor was six. Son was seven. And called Nazarene was eight. Number nine, he um, says he was called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this is really five names. Um I mean, five things, and we're going to do five studies on it because there's a lot of scripture with each one of these. But um, this book that we're studying out of, All the Messianic Prophecies of the Bible by Herbert Lockyer, um, and he says in, in this book, although Isaiah gives us such a galaxy of names the divine child was to receive at his birth, he yet uses the singular, his name shall be called. Um, so basically the, the verse is his name shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the Prince of peace. Um, as if the five he gives were, but varied facts of the one name. And, um, he says Ellicott, and I have to admit, I don't know who Ellicott is, but anyway, Ellicott comments that we have four elements of the, of the compound name, wonderful counselor. God the Mighty One, Father of Eternity, and Prince of Peace. We're going to be taking the five titles um, as they appear in order in the King James Version. Let's try to trace their combination of prediction and performance in the word. Wonderful is the first. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, is wonderful. This first of the five gathered for us in one garland expresses a marvelous burst of eloquence on the part of Isaiah. As some 700 years before Christ was born, he was able, with such accuracy of delineation, to picture all that, he, that Jesus would be in himself, and likewise accomplish. The full description tallies to the last letter with a description of the Son of God, while here among men. Prophecy, it has been said, is God's finger mark on the leaves of the book, preparing us for miracles. God's footprint on the life of the world because of all that Christ taught and accomplished and is accomplishing. He is worthy of the name wonderful. And he's lists some scriptures here and I'm going to, um, I'm going to go ahead and read them. I did. Um, I, I am going to read quite a bit more than what he listed. He just listed one scripture for each of these. I mean, one, um, one verse, but um, it always helps me to read them kind of in context. So some of them I just added one or two more verses and some quite a bit. So um, I think you will find this inspiring to, to read. Um, the first one we're going to read is Job 42 verses 1 through 3. And this is Job's confession to God right after um, God has called him on account for his complaining and his wondering why, you know, because he, he was a good man and he did try to live a godly life. He did try to live the way God wanted him to. And so he was wondering why, you know, why did all these terrible things happen to me? And his friends were telling him it's because you sinned. You must have done something really, really terrible. And he was saying, no, I didn't do any of those things. And he lists out a whole bunch of things that he did not do. And he says, you know, um, I want God to answer why this happened to me. And so this is the very beginning of what, I mean, this is, um, excuse me, right after God's answered that question. And he said, you know, where were you when the world was made? And he lists all the things that um, Job had no part in that God did. And he's saying, you know, why question me? Um, this is right before God gave Job back everything that he had lost and then a bunch. But um, he needed Job to confess that he didn't know as much as he thought he did. 
And um, that's something we all have to confess sometimes. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. So he's saying, I made all these declarations, but I didn't really understand what I was talking about. These things too wonderful me, too wonderful for me, which I did not know. So um, he did say a lot of stuff when he was answering his friends back. They were telling him, God, this, 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 and this. And he was saying, no, God is like this, this, and this. And, um, and he's saying, you know, you even gave me those words because I, I didn't need, I, this stuff's too amazing for me to know. So, so, you know, God, um, did chastise him, but, um, after these verses, God also tells his friends, you know, you didn't know what you were talking about, but Job knew the real me. And so, um, it's a, it's a pretty amazing book to read. Anyway, um, the verse that we're focusing on for this study is, Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. So he's just saying that um, God is too wonderful for me to understand. And then um, in Psalms 119 verses 129 and 130, David says, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives me light. It gives understanding to the simple. So once again, um, in the Old Testament, they're saying, you know, the things that you that you do and the things that you say, your testimonies, they're just too amazing for me to understand. And that is why it's hard for us to understand Jesus coming into this world as a baby and being God. That's all too much for us to understand. It's too wonderful for us to understand. And then um, in Isaiah, um, okay, just a second. <coughs> and this um, this is another Psalm of David. And this is 139 verses 1 through 6. And this is David talking about God's omnipresence and his omniscience. And he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. And I know when I was a kid and I read this, I thought, you know, God's spying on me. <laughs> he knows everything I do. And it felt like judgment. As I've gotten older, I understand that, um, you know, God doesn't just understand the know what I say and what I think. He also knows where my heart is. He knows that I'm in pain or that if I say things that are, um, not godly. He knows that I'm in pain or um, I've been hurt or whatever when I question him. And he knows that I really, that I believe. And so he knows my thoughts um, in a deeper way than I could have ever understood as a child. Um, he knows everything I do. He knows everything that's happening to me. And he is all around me, protecting me and holding on to me. Um, Sometimes it doesn't feel that way. It feels like everything's just going wrong. And how could things more things go wrong? You know, like Job was in that kind of a state. But God knew. And um, God knew what was going to come after this. He also knew that this was a learning time for Job. And it helped him grow um, in trust. And so um, so he knows all the things that are happening to us. They help us grow as well. Um, so my cha my um, understanding of this verse has changed a lot since I became an adult. And then in Isaiah, um, verses twenty, chapter twenty five, uh, verse one says, "O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness." So he's already praising God for the wonderful things he's done that he planned a long time ago that were part of the plan. And this is still in the Old Testament. Jesus hasn't even gotten here yet. And so 
some really amazing wonders haven't even happened. Um, but Isaiah is already amazed and thinks that how, you know, wonderful in the way of causing wonder. It is also in Isaiah 28. I'm going to read verses 21 through 29 because I think the text behind this verse 29 is the actual verse that Lockyer wants us to read. But I think the text behind it helps it to mean even more to us. Isaiah says, For the Lord will rise up at Mount Perizim. He will be stirred up as in the valley of Gibeon to, to do his task, his unusual task, and to work his work, his extraordinary work. And now do not carry on as scoffers, or your fetters will be made stronger. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts of decisive destruction on all the earth. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my words. Does the farmer plow continually to plant seed? Does he continually turn and harrow the ground? Does he not level its surface and sow dill and scatter cumin and plant wheat and rose and barley in its place and rye within its area? For his God instructs him and teaches him properly. So he's saying God even taught the farmers how to farm and when to do things. For dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel driven over the cumin. Dill is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a club. Grain for bread is crushed. Indeed, he does not continue to thresh it forever. Because the wheel of his cart and his horses would eventually damage it. He does not thresh it any longer. This also comes from the Lord God of hosts, who has made his counsel wonderful and his wisdom great. So he's saying that, um, you know, God allows things to happen in our lives that hurt. But they're the things that make us grow. And um, and he knows because his, his counsel is wonderful and his wisdom is great. And he will teach us what we can learn. Um, he'll teach us how to plant the garden. He will teach us how not to, to damage things if we let him. Also, in Isaiah chapter 9, um, he's talking about, he uses chapter, I mean, verse 6. But once again, I want to read what comes up to that because I think it matters. Verses 1 through 6 say, But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he, tr he treated the land of Zebulun and this land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So he's saying this gloriousness that's going to come to Israel is going to come from the other side of the sea, other side of Jordan, from, ja from Galilee, where the Gentiles are. These people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness, and they will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For, and this is the verse that he wants us to concentrate on, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. We read this verse when we were talking about Counselor last week. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So, um, you know, through all this, he's listing the things that happened that were bad. And he's saying it's not always going to be this way. Um, there's coming redemption. There's coming someone who is going to save us. Now, it may not have been the kind of salvation they were expecting, um, but it was also, you know, you know, because God knows more than we do. <laughs> All right. The Hebrew word for wonderful is secret. Let's just think about that for a minute. Wonderful means secret. So if something is wonderful, it's something we cannot understand. Um, and since we can't understand it, that's what makes it so wonderful, so amazing, so um, because it's so improbable to us in our finite mind. 
the same word secret is given as wondrously. And um, this is what we know of Jesus. His wonderful words, works, and witness prove him to be the son given. It would have been more wonderful or more secret or more, under, you know, more incomprehensible um, if Jesus, being all that he was, had performed no mighty works. So basically he's saying we shouldn't be surprised he did amazing things because he's God's son. And so, you know, it would have been even more amazing if he didn't do these wonderful things. So don't be amazed by the wonders he did. Um, that's natural to someone who is God. The verse that he quotes here um, is Judges 13, and I'm reading 15 through 20. And it says, Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, um, Please let us detain you so that we may prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. Because he had just, in the previous verses, told them what was going to happen in their family. Um, but the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? The other word could be incomprehensible. Why do you ask my name, seeing that it is incomprehensible? Or why do you ask my name, seeing that it is secret? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and looked on. For it came about when the flame went up from the altar towards heaven, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. So they finally understood this was not a, just a person they were talking to. But they had to see something wonderful to understand that. Now, um, the fulfillment of these prophecies that we just read is in Matthew and Luke and Acts. And so we're going to um, read some of those verses now. Matthew 21, verses 14 through 16 says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple... Hosanna to the son of David. They became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise for yourself. So he's quoting to them from the Old Testament. I meant to look it up and I, I forgot to. But anyway, in this particular version, when it come, when it's read... Um, when it's written in a different font like that, that's usually what it means. This is a quote from the Old Testament. And then in Luke 4, verses 16 through 30. Now, this is a really long one. Um, but I think that it's important to read all of it and not just the last verse where the word wonder and wonderful is used. Um, and you probably get tired of hearing me say that. I probably should stop saying it and just read it. <laughs> Sorry. And he came to Nazareth where he had been, and this is Jesus that we're talking about here. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. You could just see everybody staring at him and waiting. What's he going to say? And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and saying, Is this not... Um, I'm sorry. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to be, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. 
So he's saying, you're, you're going to say, you know, we heard about all these wonderful things you're doing. Now do these miracles for us. We want to see it, you know. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many windows in is widows, excuse me, many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them. He was sent to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but Naaman, the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things and they got up. Okay, so they were wanting him to do wonderful things. And he's saying, you're not going to believe me even if you see wonderful things because I'm a hometown boy. And he gives proof as to why this was true. And then all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. They just proved his point, didn't they? <laughs> oh. But passing through their midst, he went on his way. So they had plan they were planning to kill him. But um, he was able just to walk away from them because God was with him. And then um, in Acts, <clears throat> verse chapter 2, verses 23 to 24, it says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So he's saying... You know, um, some of them, so, Jesus knew, and he handed himself over. You know, you you did this, but Jesus allowed it to happen because he could have stopped it, but he didn't. Um, but God raised him again because he submitted, raised him again and put an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. So he had to submit to this happening to him. Um, it was impossible for him to be killed and um, and held in the power of death because he had not sinned. But he still allowed death to come so that he could beat death for our sakes. And the um, final verses we're going to read are Acts 4, verses 13 through 31. Um, and this is when... Um, the um, when Peter and John, excuse me, I forgot their names for a second. When Peter and John had been arrested and they they were trying to decide what to do with them because there was a huge crowd that was listening to them preach, and they were like, "Well, we don't want them preaching about Jesus, but we can't put them in jail or we'll have a mob on our hands." So, um, so this is what happened while they were in this place. It says, "Now, as they observed the confidence." of Peter and John, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed, and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. So they realized by the things they were saying that um, they, they, they couldn't have come by this information on their own, and they also realized this is the same stuff Jesus was saying. And seeing the man who had been healed, um, in the previous verses that we didn't read, they had healed someone. Um, Sorry, I got off track with that. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another. So they just told them to leave. You know, they didn't know what to say. Um, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. So they would have liked to. They would have liked to have said, this didn't happen. It's just a rumor. But they couldn't because people saw it. You know, everybody in Jerusalem knew about it. Um, but so that it will not spread any further among the people, let's warn them to speak no longer any, um, 
any man in this name. So they're telling them, none of you can ever talk about Jesus again. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Listen to Peter and John. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Okay, so they're saying, you know, if you if you think we should do what you want us to do instead of what God's told us to do, well, then you can judge us. But we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop talking about Jesus. And then it says, when they had threatened them further, they let them go. So they kept on threatening them, um, saying they were going to punish them. But it says they that finding no um, no basis on which to punish them on, amount, on account of the people, because the people were all glorifying God for what happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So everybody knew him. For 40 years, he had been in this sad state. And um, suddenly he wasn't anymore. You know, you can't deny this is a miracle that these men performed. And you can't deny that they performed it in Jesus' name. Um, so they had to let him go because the people, you know, they, they were afraid of the people. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And they, that, they were quoting David and now it tells us why. And they're, going, they're still talking to God. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of these threats, and grant your bond servants that we may speak your word with all confidence while you extend, extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders to take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began, began to speak the word of God with boldness. So they didn't pray. Um, you know, they prayed that God would continue to preserve them so they could continue to preach Jesus and that he would not only um, give them the words to say and protect them, but he would give them the courage to say it against all of these people who were rallying against them. How worthy Jesus was of his name wonderful because he was in himself all that this name implied. He was wonderful in his teaching which has never been surpassed by the world's greatest scholars. He was wonderful in his character, the marvel being that while others became repentant and were converted under his influence, he himself never had anything to repent of. He was wonderful in his life because of its purity and plan, a saving plan he brought about through his death and resurrection. And then there's a little poem here I want to read. It says, Oh, wonderful, round whose birth home, prophetic song, miraculous power, cluster and turn like star and flower so um we're you know we're in the time of year where we celebrate jesus's birth and um and we sing songs about wonderful counselor and um all the names that were given to jesus before he was born and it's um it's a, it's a good time to be reading these scriptures oh I went ahead and did a lot of prep work on my um, on the page we're going to do today. I'm having trouble with my shoulder, and so I knew I needed a fussy cut and ink and stuff like that, and I needed to do it in my lap and not up here on the table. So I just went ahead and did all those things. So we're just going to put it together. This is going to be quick and easy. <laughs> I've got this song that I'm gonna I'm gonna read it to you. Let me get it in order here. Oh, I almost read the wrong side. And that did not make any sense. Okay. 
I'm going to read the verses and I'll just read the chorus once. Mm. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace in heaven for all eternity. And the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the, um, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. We all have a, a lot. If we've accepted Jesus, we have a lot to be grateful for because he took anything we've ever done and cleansed us from it. And if you haven't, um, he will do that for you too, if you just ask him. I'm going to glue these down to make my background. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Okay. That'll make it easier too. And I think I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to put glue all over this. Let me get a piece of wax paper. Oh, here, this will work. Okay. I'm trying very hard to not use my right arm. Um, thankfully, I'm left-handed. I'm trying very hard not to use it in ways that will um, cause any strain because I've got it's got to heal. <laughs> Um, it's taking longer than I want it to, but I'm trying to be very good. So, some of you sweet ladies, and you know who you are, have arm or hand trouble. And you've been doing art and things with one hand for a long time. And I thought I understood how hard that would be. Um, and I was always admired your ability to keep on keeping on with a good spirit and doing art. But um, I don't think I really understood <laughs> um, until now how, how really hard it can be. And I still, I know... I still have more use, even as much as it's hurting. I still have more use than a couple of you do. And I just want you to know, once again, how much I admire your fortitude. And um, keeping on with what you're doing. In spite of the, the trouble with your arm and your hand. It's... Mine is mostly, if I can keep my, if I can keep my upper arm tucked in really close to my side and not put any weight on my hand, you know, I can do things like this, but I can't reach out or up or grab and pull or any of those things. And so, um, I'm trying to make, make things easier on myself. Um, I first cut this out and I was just going to put it here and then I realized I really want it to be up higher than that so I went ahead and cut this out too um I mean I just yeah I'm gonna let's see
I'm just going to go ahead and trim that. Uh, I had everything all inked. Let me. Sorry, just a second. Okay. I'm going to, this is a heavier, this was a gift bag. I'll show you what it looked like. <laughs> that, that has one side that's matte and one side that's sparkly. But that's what this flower came off of. I hope that these verses really um, blessed you as much as they did me. It, it's this going into a deeper look at each of the names of Jesus and what they mean and how they were prophesied in the Old Testament. This is all very much blessed me. And sharing the Bible with you, is, I hope, is blessing you. It blesses me to do that, too. Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't put it over far enough. We're just going to do that. We're just going to tuck it under there. It's going to be all right. Oh, I had this little dragonfly I wanted to stick under there. Um, Let's see if we can get it to go anyway. It's not going to, um, no, I think we're just going to have to forget the dragonfly. Sorry. He was cute, but I forgot and glued it down before I did it. <laughs> okay. And the verse we're using today is Psalm 19, I mean Psalm 119, excuse me. Verses 29 and 30. Your testimonies are wonderful. They're my, therefore, my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Um, so we can all understand the word of God. We don't, you don't have to be um, a brilliant scholar to understand the gospel. You just have to study it and believe it. Oh. Ooh, I had glue down there. Okay, this is a very simple page, but I think it's pretty. God bless you, and you have a great day. Bye-bye.